Well, good morning. Everyone, it's so good to see you this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let's all stand together. And uh, as we get started this morning, we want to ask God's blessing on the service today. And so uh, let's bow together and just uh, bow before the Lord. And, and let's just all pray in our hearts today that God will just do something special among us. Amen? Let us pray together as I lead us this morning. Our Father, Lord, we just, we just come before you today. And Lord, just do something in our presence. We know that you are here. You have promised that, Lord, where we're gathered to gather, that you're in our midst. And, and uh, Lord, and since uh, we are, as believers, we are filled with the Spirit of God, we know that you are here in this place. But, Lord, we just don't want this to be just an ordinary day, just another day. But Lord, we want to make it a day that where we sense your presence, where we sense your working in our midst. Now, bless and Lord, as we begin this morning by singing praises to you and worshiping you through our song, bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. The whole reason we're here is what Jesus did at the cross. So let's sing that this morning.
Amen. Lead me to the cross. Well, once again, it's uh, good to see each and every one of you today. We're so glad that you could come and, and uh, be a part of the service today and, and uh, corporate worship here. And I just want to remind you of a few things. Uh, tomorrow, just three weeks from tomorrow, I should say, is, uh, is camp, is summer camp. That's kind of uh, hard to believe here. It's right upon us. And uh, so there'll be a meeting Right after the service this morning up front here, just for uh, the workers, those that are planning to go, and uh, really just kind of give an idea of who all is uh, going to camp this year as uh, workers, so we know how to plan there. And uh, we're looking forward to a, to a great week. Be praying now, and I uh, hope you've already been, but if you haven't, be praying now that God will just do something really great in our camp this year. He always does, and we look forward to it. And, uh, and then um, uh, tonight is... Um, the last Awana service, and so uh, uh, let's be uh, praying uh, about that, our last week of Awana, so just want to uh, remind you of that. And then, uh, you know, going back to camp for just a second, we have a, a, a supply list in the vestibule of things that, uh, that we uh, put out that if you can sign up to bring, it's uh, food, and, you know, for our food and canteen. And that helps our camp expense greatly by doing that. And so if you uh, haven't had a chance to look at that supply list, uh, be sure and go by after the service today in the vestibule and look at that and see if there's something on there that you could uh, help us out with. And that would be a great blessing. All right, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Our Father, Lord, as we come before you again, Lord, we just want to we wanna acknowledge that, um, Lord, that you're are with us today. And Lord, I just pray that your spirit would just, just be known among us. And Father, we so often we just kind of get in the routine of just coming to church without any expectation of what the Spirit of God may do upon us. And Lord, I just pray now, I pray that, that, um, that Lord, we would just even now, that our hearts, Lord, would be moved in such a way that, Lord, that we just are excited about being able to come together and to worship. Lord, may it be known in our song, in our, in our expression. And Lord, may it be known on our face and in our hearts and in our lives and our attitudes. And Lord, we pray for those in our church family that are not able to be with us. And so many that we've already prayed for this morning. And we come before you again just asking petitions on behalf of each and every one of these. And those that are sick and those that are, um, some will be having surgeries uh, tomorrow even and procedures. And Lord, we pray for them. And we pray that, 
you would just give them a, a, a quick recovery from, from their surgeries. And for those that are healing now from surgeries and other things that they um, have had done here, Lord, we pray for them. And we pray that you lift them up, raise them up, strengthen them. And Lord, for those who have other needs today, whether it's emotional or physical or financial or spiritual in nature, God, we pray that you will just work mightily in their lives and do something wonderful, do a miracle. We pray, Lord, today for our nation. We, uh, again, are, are stricken by this evil in Buffalo, New York, where this young boy just goes in and just starts shooting people randomly. It's just pure evil. And we see it too often. And actually, it happens every single day in our inner cities all around our nation. And it's becoming uh, more and more frequent and more fragrant. And Lord, we just, we just pray that there would be a, a raising up of Christians all over this nation like never before, praying over our streets, our cities, our neighborhoods, our schools. And Father, we pray that, um, that you would just be here in our local, in our, in our, with our local leaders and law enforcement and political leaders, and even in the elections that we have coming up. And this, the, the right people would be elected to these offices. And that we could have a uh, a greater sense of security and law enforcement. And we pray for those men and women that are on the front lines every single day and many of them feeling like their hands are tied and there's nothing they could do. And Lord, we pray for them. And Father, we pray that you would be with um, uh, the offerings that we receive today. And Lord, just bless them. Lord, I, we reminded so often, I was just reading this morning, of so many verses in the Bible, Lord, that speaks about giving and giving with a generous heart and, and not giving under compulsion, but Lord, just giving freely. Lord, giving in faith. And Lord, you love it when, we, when your people exercise faith, when they show faith in you. And Lord, we know that this is one of those areas that really reveals the heart of the believer is our willingness to trust you in giving. And Father, we uh, pray that you would bless all the offerings that are received today, bless those that would come in this week through the online giving. And we pray now these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand again as we continue singing. You know, I don't know, I, I felt kind of like I was the only one standing there singing this morning, amen? You don't really want to hear me, so I want to hear you. So let's really just, let's just, uh, let's just get into this mode here that we are here to worship, amen? And let our voices be heard to the highest heavens, amen?
Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. We have been in a series uh, on about uh, encouragement, exhortation, which means to, uh, to encourage, to strengthen, and to uh, comfort. You know, last week I mentioned that I had this uh, new portable uh, sound system, and it has these effects on it. There was this button on there you can push, and it will applause. I was going to bring it. I actually forgot, but maybe I won't need it today if you'll help me out. Amen? So try to help me uh, today, and uh, there won't even be any need for that. But if I need to bring that, then uh, I may go look for it. Uh, Just kidding. But anyway, you know, there is a great need for encouragement today. Some of you sitting here, I bet you, uh, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that there are people in this room today who need encouragement. The reality is all of us need encouragement, but there are times in our lives where we really need someone to come along beside of us and really just encourage us. You know, we see that in the life of the Apostle Paul, there was a need for encouragement in his life. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And to the Galatians he wrote, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Paul was writing here out of his own experience because he had arrived and we're in our main text today is Acts chapter 18 and this is where he arrived in Corinth and when he arrived and when he arrived in Corinth he was weary and I don't suppose there's anybody in our service who doesn't get to that place in their life. I don't suppose there's any Christian who could say I've never been discouraged. I've never been disheartened. We've all been there. And again, maybe some of us are weary in well-doing. But God is in the business of encouragement. And Paul, when he arrived in Corinth, he had, I mean, he had had it. He had been chased halfway around the world. He started out in Antioch, Assyria. And on a simple missionary journey with Silas, he confirmed some churches in the area near Syria. He went through Galatia. He confirmed some saints there. He took off and he continued west and he pursued a course that was driven by the Holy Spirit. He finally crossed over from Troas to Philippi. And there he preached and he was was there harassed and chased out of town. Then he arrived in Thessalonica. He was persecuted terribly. He had to run for his life. And he got to Berea. He left there, he went to Berea. And when he got to Berea, no sooner had he established a church than the Thessalonians arrived and chased him again. And he finally found him in the city of Athens. And there he was weary. He was not persecuted there, but but, uh, he was able to preach the gospel and he gave clear presentation of the gospel. But there was not... A lot that happened as a result of his ministry and his preaching there. And then he comes and he arrives in Corinth and he's alone. Most of the time he's with someone, but this time he's alone. And he's discouraged, he's despondent, he's weak. And he may have been even physically well. And we know this because later he would write back to the church at Corinth and he would say that I was with you in weakness in chapter 2 and verse number 3. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, he says, probably meaning that he was sick. And it was at that point that God moves in to encourage him. See, I believe that God knows, well, I don't believe, I know the fact that God knows when we need encouragement. And he will send people into our path. He'll put people along our path in order to encourage us. And we're going to see how God used a relatively unknown couple here in Acts chapter 18 to be an encouragement to the Apostle Paul. Now the book of Acts, the title, the full book of Acts, is the Acts of the Apostles. 
And it records the various actions of the apostles, the early church, and, and some other individuals that are not as known, well known. But however, if we are completely accurate, we want to be specific, we would not refer to the book of Acts as the book of the book of, or the Acts of the Apostles, but rather the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because the secret of effectiveness of the early church was not personalities. It was not due to the influence of articulate men. It was not the result of, of dynamic personalities. It was by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And in and of themselves, the apostles were not capable of accomplishing the mighty acts that they do. Peter readily admits, silver and gold have I none. It was said of, of Peter and John that they were unlearned and ignorant men. In other words, they had no formal training. They had no other qualifications as teachers and preachers. They lacked large financial base to promote their ministry and influence. But what they had was the power of the Holy Spirit of God working in them and through them. And in large part, this is a great missing element of the modern church. We are inundated with personalities and people who esteem themselves greater than they are. The modern church has more formally trained members with degrees of higher learning than ever before. The church has far more money at its, at its disposal than it's ever had in history. I mean, I mean just, just the average person now has more money at their disposal than than they've ever had. Now, some of you say, well, that's not me, but I'm talking about as a whole, as, as, as a Western culture. My wife and I were watching uh, this show last night about, uh, about uh, valuable collect collectors and collections. And this guy, he has this collection of Pokemon cards. Anybody here even know what a Pokemon card is? I remember our oldest son, I think, well, he'll be 34, but I, I think it was our oldest son who had this collection when he was a little boy of Pokemon. That's the only reason I know what they are. This guy comes in, I mean, he's got, these, he's got this collection of cards. And just one of those cards was worth $30,000. Now, it's not worth $30,000, but there is someone who will pay $30,000. His whole collection was estimated at almost $400,000. Now you've got to be a rich culture in order to spend four hundred grand on a stupid Pokemon card. Now some of you are saying, we are talking about a stupid Pokemon card? I got, I got a bunch of those. <laughs> okay, sorry. And this guy had a collection of Transformers. He had like a thousand of them in his room. And they were estimated worth of a, these are just toys now. Of about 20 grand. Another guy had a collection of Dukes of Hazards. One of the worst shows ever. <laughs> I remember as a teenager, that, you know, that we didn't have cable. There was only so many things on television. And that was uh, one of three shows. And it was the best of the three, and I still couldn't stand it. I hated that show, you know. But anyway, again, some of you say, well, yeah, I love that show. That's my favorite show of all time, you know. That's because you like Daisy Duke. Come on, just be honest. You need to get right with God. I'm just kidding. But anyway, he had this Dukes of Hazard collection, and, and it was worth a crazy amount of money. And, and, and so on and so on. I mean, that's just a few of thousands of things that people collect. I, I mean, I love old cars. You know, I watch these old car shows, and, and man, I mean, you know, the money that people put into and that, And it's, a, it's amazing how many people have collection of old cars worth millions of dollars i'm like where do all these people get all of this money i don't know <laughs> but anyway there's a lot of money flowing out there and there's a lot of money that flows through our churches with little note with little impact on the real world around us the fact is education funding is no substitute for the power of the Holy Spirit of God. 
There is nothing that can duplicate or cultivate what the Holy Spirit of God can do. There is no limit to what God can do and accomplish through one congregation, through Lumpkin Road Baptist Church, who was sold out for Him and filled with the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts is a selective history of the church and all that was accomplished by the Holy Spirit. All those things that we read, all those miraculous wonders and signs and things, it was all done by the power of the Holy Spirit. It was not about personalities. It was not, a, it was not, about, it was not about great gifts. But it was about the person of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of ordinary men and women through whom God was able to do extraordinary things. You see, it, you see, it is not that God is looking for people with extraordinary talent to do extraordinary things. He's looking for ordinary people who will sell out to the Holy Spirit of God would give themselves and yield themselves over to the Holy Spirit of God to do extraordinary things. And there's a place where I need that button and say, Amen! D.L. Moody. It was said of Henry Varley, a British revivalist, who had befriended a young man, a young American, in Dublin by the name of D.L. Moody. And he recalled that in 1873... Moody asked him to recount the words that he had spoken in private conversation a year earlier, just before Moody's return to the United States. And Varley provides this account. He said, During the afternoon of the day of a conference, Mr. Moody asked me to join him in the vestry of the Baptist church. We were alone, and he recalled the night's meeting at Willow Park, our converse, the following morning. And Moody asked, do you remember your words? Varley replied, I remember our interview, but I do not recall any special utterance. Moody says, don't you remember saying, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him? Not the actual words, Varley replied. Ah, oh, Mr. Moody those were the words that sent my soul through you from the living God. As I crossed the wide Atlantic, the boards of the deck of the vessel were engraved with them. When I reached Chicago, the very paving stones seemed to be marked with Moody. The, word, the world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. Under the power of those words, I have come back to England, Moody said. I have felt that I must not let more time pass until I let you know how God has used those words to my inmost soul. And it was said that Moody preached to millions of people. This was in the 1800s. And over a million people came to Jesus, the saving grace in, the Jesus, in Jesus Christ under his preaching. Now here in the book of Acts, chapter 18, we are introduced to a couple, Aquila and Priscilla. They were ordinary people, but their willingness to be used of God enabled them to be a part of an extraordinary work. Very little is known about this particular couple other than what little is written about them. We know that they were a husband and wife, tent makers by trade. We know that they became personal friends and co-laborers of the Apostle Paul, we know that they were completely invested in the work of the Lord using their own home. We know that they had put their lives in jeopardy in order to minister to Paul and other believers. There's only six verses in four books that make any mention of Aquila and Priscilla. They were not super saints with a large fan club. They were never featured in Christianity Today. They never made the headlines of any pre, uh, prestigious church magazines. They were not like Paul or Peter. But their willingness to serve made an impact on those around them. And although they might be considered obscure figures in 
the New Testament narrative, God knew their names and honored their faithfulness. Now, if you don't remember anything else, but remember this, that Aquila and Priscilla, God knew their names and honored their faithfulness. Amen? There are many lessons that we can learn from their testimony. So let's just very quickly consider a few this morning, a couple. First of all, we see that they were engaged in service. Now, in chapter 18, in verse 24, it says, A certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mining the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them. And, and, and there is, again, a very key phrase to underline in your Bible. They took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. In verse 27, And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. Now here we see that word exhort once again. And, and that word means to admonish, it means to encourage, and it means to instruct. As I have said so many times, it is a very rich word with a lot of meaning. Now I want you to know that there are people with the specific gift of exhortation. And uh, I mean, while we are all instructed to give exhortation... And that's why we've been preaching this series on exhortation of strength and courage and comfort. But there are people with a specific gift. And sometimes you might be with that person. And, and, you know, it seems like that as you're there with someone and this person begins to minister to another person who's really downtrodden, and they seem to have just the right words to say. They say words that go just right to the heart. Their words are so comforting. Their words seem to have such impact. And you think to yourself, you know, wow, I mean, I wish I could have thought of that. I mean, why didn't didn't I think of those words to say? And, And the reason why is because you don't have that specific gift of exhortation that the person that you're with may have. But don't be discouraged. Because, again, we are all... We are all given that ministry of exhortation, of encouragement, strengthening, comforting. They encouraged the Apostle Paul. We saw in the introduction that Paul needed to be encouraged, and God put Aquila and Priscilla in the Apostle Paul's path so that he could do just that. It says in verse 1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens. He came to Corinth, and he found certain Jew named Aquila, born And Pontus lately come from Italy and his wife Priscilla. Now it was no accident that these three lives crossed at a particular place and a particular time. You know, I I often pray for certain individuals, and I even pray for my for my own uh, uh, children that are uh, that are that that are grown and married and and, and have children themselves, and I don't have the everyday influence on their lives like I did when they were growing up. And and, uh, and so I don't see them every day. I don't talk to them every day. And so I often pray. Well, I don't often pray. I pray every day that God would put people in their path that would be a positive influence on them for Christ Jesus. Amen? And I pray for other people like that, that I don't have maybe uh, the type of relationship that someone else might be able to have with them, though I know them and I know needs that they have, and though I may have some influence on their life, but but because of uh, 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 geographically I'm not with them or see them, I pray that in their lives every day. It wasn't too long ago that, uh, that my wife and I, who had uh, uh, been praying for someone, and and you know as we uh, we saw them after a, a, a good period of time, and and uh, and as we began to uh, visit with them and to talk with them, we just sensed something that was different about them almost instantly. And it was a young man who grew up in church, and he had gotten away from the Lord, 
for many, many years, and, and he was just hard-hearted and, and, and just, uh, just had this rebellious, stubborn spirit. I mean, we could immediately sense that there was something different about him. And he began to tell us that how God put a man in his life. They could see right through him. He was, just, he, was just, he was just, you know, trying to put on this front. And this gentleman could see right through him, and he could speak truth right to his heart. And I said, amen. I mean, that, that's why I pray that. For other individuals, and listen, while, while Paul here is, is, is certainly not in a place of sin, but he is in a place of despair, and God put two people in his life that he needed at that very moment. Paul enters Corinth with, with numerous battle scores. He, he's tired. He is no doubt feeling the pressure of ministry. And unlike and other, like other times, he is traveling alone in his path crosses with this dear couple. And I can imagine they were like a cool drink of water when Paul met them and started talking with them and fellowshipping with them. And we see the beginning of Paul's ministry there in Corinth in verse 4. And it says, And he reasoned the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and Gentiles. He was strengthened. and In other words, he was strengthened to go on and to continue preaching the gospel. It says in verse 5, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Macedonia Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, in other words, they began, to, they, they, they began to make fun of Paul. He shook his raiment, and he said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence, and he entered into a certain man's house named Justice. Now, here's what's, here's what's interesting about this. You know, Paul says, well, I've had it with these Jews, and I'm done. I'm just going to go, and I'm, gonna, and I'm, just gonna, I'm just going to spend my life and my ministry and my energy to, these, to the Gentiles. You know where he winds up? He winds up at a man's house by the name of Justice. And you know where Justice lived? He lived in a house that was attached to the synagogue. Who goes to synagogues? The Jews. <laughs> and you know what happens here? It says, it says uh, in verse number 8, And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Amen? <laughs> Now, you, now listen again, the, the, the reason why that Paul is re-energized here is because of the support and the encouragement of this couple that God put in his path. And I don't care who we are, I don't care who you are, or how strong you think you are, there are times in all of our lives where we need someone just to be there and be an encouragement, to be that cool drink of water. That refreshing wind that blows upon us. God was doing something great. And again, Paul was facing tremendous trial and difficulty, yet he's not alone. Friends, there are people around you every day. There are people in this auditorium right now who are on the brink of throwing in the towel, calling it quits, walking away from everything. There are people in this church who are quietly struggling. The pressures of life with work, with home, with a host of responsibilities that are pressing hard upon them. They are hurting, they are feeling all alone. They feel like that they are in this struggle and that there is no one who cares. The psalmist felt that way. In Psalm 142, he says, I looked on my right hand and beheld there was no man. There was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Now maybe that wasn't true, but that's the way he felt at that moment. And we've all felt that way. 
He's saying, hey, I look for someone to come and to help me. But no one gives me even a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares one bit about what happens to me. And there are people that God places in our sphere of influence. People like that. People that need to be encouraged. People that can be encouraged. Encouragement comes in many ways. It might be a simple act of kindness. It might be a text message, an email, just to let them know that you are thinking about them, praying for them. It might be a card. It might be a spoken word at just the right time. It might be a visit. I know so oftentimes when I have visit with someone that, you know, I just felt need lifted up, that I needed, that needed encouraged, I've, I've, I've so often gone away feeling like I didn't accomplish anything. But I always remember early in the ministry when we were in Pennsylvania, there was a young couple in our church that had a, little, a six-year-old girl. She had that very, very rare disease of progeria. There's like only one of six. There's like only about six children in the world at any one time that have this disease. And I mean, she was, she was on like television shows, you know, and all this stuff. And, but she passed away. She was six years old. And the father just, he took it so hard. He didn't come to church a lot in the first place. But he was, man, he was just really struggling. And his wife called me one day and she said, Will you go by and see Don? Just try to talk to him. I thought, okay, well, I'll try. I don't know what I can say to him. He owned a little, they owned a little store gas station out in the country. And I, and I went out to see him and he was, he was the only employee. It was just a little country store and he had a little mechanic shop. And he would go out and pump somebody's gas and he'd go in the store and sell something. And he would go in the shop and work in the car. And I just kind of followed him around and... I was just trying to talk to him. And I, you know, I didn't know what to say. But I was just there, you know. And I didn't say a whole lot. I just hung around with him. And I left and I felt, ah, well, Lord, I tried, but I didn't, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to say. And a couple of days later, he comes up to me to church on his motorcycle. And he walked into the office and he sat down. And he said, I just wanted to thank you for coming by to see me the other day. It meant so much. And I always try to remember that when I feel like that, you know, I, I tried to encourage someone and it, and, and, it, and it didn't mean anything to them. It didn't help. But you never know. Even though there may not be a reaction, maybe they don't give you a big hug and thank you at that moment. Maybe you don't rock their world. But it doesn't mean that you didn't make a difference. Amen? Proverbs says, a fitly word spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. In 25, verse 25, it says, Cold water, as cold water to a thirsty soul, so is good news from a far country. See, Aquila and Priscilla, they were engaged in the service of encouraging saints. And we're out of time, but let me just, let me just try to remind you of something here of this series that we've been talking about. And remember, remember it began with, um, with uh, that fellow I said that you, you probably wouldn't know his, you, you probably wouldn't know his name, and I'm trying to think of it here. Uh, his name was Epaphroditus <laughs> in the book of Philippians. And Epaphroditus is one of those guys that most people don't even know that name today. But Epaphroditus was another person that God put in the path of the Apostle Paul at a time when Paul needed someone. And he was there, and he became a good friend to Paul, and an encouragement and a strength to Paul. And then there was Barnabas, who also, at the beginning of Paul's ministry, after Paul's conversion, when no one wanted to have anything to do with the Apostle Paul, but, but Barnabas did. Barnabas took Paul in and, 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 and became a friend to him and encouraged him and, and, and helped him get established in the ministry and earned the trust of other believers. And then there was John Mark, another, another time where Barnabas comes uh, and puts his arm around a, son, a young man. And even Paul himself was done with John Mark because John Mark had deserted them on a missionary tour. And Paul was done, but, but Paul, but remember what the Bible says? But Barnabas. Remember that? 
I told you to underline those three words, but Barnabas. And Barnabas says, I'll take him with me. And later Paul would write Barnabas and say, and say, bring John Mark, for he is profitable to the ministry. And now we see this couple. Again, another unknown couple by the name of Aquila and Priscilla. And they come to Paul's aid. We would also see that they would come to another man by the name of Apollos who had heard of, he he had been a disciple of John the Baptist, and he didn't know the full story of the gospel. And he was preaching, but he wasn't preaching the full story. And so many people may have written him off, but Aquila and Priscilla said, no, let's, let's take this young man, and let's encourage him, and let's tell him, let's disciple him, and let's fill him in on the, on, on the rest of the details, things that he needs to know. And I want you to see what happens down in, Verse 27, it says, And when he was disposed to pass, talking about Apollos, and when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, whom when he was come, helped them much. In other words, this is Apollos who went to Achaia, and when he got there, he had, he had to be, they had to be encouraged to receive him, but when he got them, you know what? He became a great blessing to them. And look at verse 28, it says, For he mightily convinced Jews, and that, and that, and that, and that pub, uh, publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. You know why this happened? Because this couple that no one knows about took him in. Now we see the example of Paul. Paul became an almighty apostle of Jesus Christ. Wrote, a, wrote half of the New Testament. We see John Mark, who Barnabas, but Barnabas, came to his side. And Barnabas came a mighty disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And wrote the gospel of the book of Mark. And there we see again this Apollos, who became a mighty preacher. And it was all because of ordinary people who were just willing to give themselves to the ministry of encouragement, of exhortation, which is to encourage, to strengthen, to comfort, to come alongside of someone. And by the way, we saw in the example of Epaphroditus, he minister to Paul at the risk of his own life. We will see that Aquila and Priscilla would come to the ministry of Paul at the, at the risk of their freedom and of their lives. So it was no small thing that they did, but they were not afraid. They were willing to be used of God. And because these individuals, and there's not even, by the way, Barnabas, whose name means encouragement, there's not even a lot written about him. He doesn't have a book after his name. But the people in his sphere knew who he was. The people in Aquila and Priscilla's sphere knew who he was. The people in Epaphroditus' sphere, they knew who he was. And most importantly, God knew who they were. And he used their faithfulness. Amen. Let's bow. Father, Lord, we thank you for this, again, the wonderful instructions that we see here. And Lord, we are so blessed by the faithfulness of the example of these individuals that you used in a mighty way. And Lord, every one of us here could give testimony of people that you put in our lives at very critical times to encourage us, to strengthen us, to bring us comfort, sometimes to correct us but they did it lovingly, compassionately. 
And Father, we can be those individuals in the lives of others. If we will yield ourselves to the power and the working of the Holy Spirit of God, the words that Moody took in and took to heart, that became his heartbeat, that the world is yet to see what God can do to a person who is fully yielded to the power of the Holy Spirit, those words still ring true today. And Father, maybe there's someone here today who needs Jesus Christ. They need to receive Him as Lord and Savior. There's never been a time in their life where they yielded to themselves or yielded themselves to, to you. To, and Father, I pray that they would understand the need of salvation, which requires us to acknowledge that we are sinners and that we are to repent, meaning turn from those sins and turn to the only one who can free us from the enslavement, the entrapment of sin in our life that has bound us to condemnation. But Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and He rose again so that He could break the power of sin. And Lord, if we will receive the wonderful gift of salvation, we can be forgiven of all of our sins, our past, our present, and even our future sins because of the power of the cross. And Father, if there's someone that needs to do that today, I pray that they would. Maybe someone listening online needs to turn to Jesus. I pray they would. Lord, maybe you've put someone on our heart today as we've been talking about this need of encouragement that we need to call, we need to write, we need to send a text message or, or stop by and visit or send a card or something, some way. And Lord, help us to follow through. It may indeed cost us time. It may cost us money. It may even cause us to risk something else, even more valuable. But Lord, if you put it on our heart, help us that we might do it. And there is no telling the impact that may result from this word of encouragement. Bless now this invitation in Jesus' name. Let's all stand together. As we sing this song of invitation, the altar is open. If you want to come this morning and pray about anything at all, then we invite you to come. Christ, lead us. Or, I'm sorry. Uh, Brother uh, Gary, uh, Jerry, lead us as we sing this morning. Hear the Spirit call. Come just as you are. Come receive. Come and live.
again. Our Father, we thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for your mighty working spirit among us. And Father, we pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So if there's some, some resolve that we made today, Lord, help us, give us strength to follow through. And we pray this now in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Well, it's so good to see you today and, and so glad to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again tonight. As I said, it's the last regular Awana service. And so make sure if you have Awana age children that you get them here uh, for this uh, very important uh, service. And, um, and then our regular service at uh, 6 p.m. We'll be meeting in here tonight for those uh, in the general service. And uh, so we'll see you back this afternoon. God bless you, Brother Jerry. My, my peripheral vision has let me down a little bit. I, and uh, so uh, anyway, Brother Jerry, lead us in a song as we dismiss.